I have been talking about how to develop deep intimacy with Jesus. How to deepen your love for Jesus. And the question is this. What is that intimacy? And how you develop it? The word intimacy, like so many other words like love and democracy and all those words, are kind of really misunderstood and, and banded about without proper definitions or misinterpreted in many ways. Today, if you ask the average person the word intimacy, they think you're talking about sexual intimacy. That's how our culture uh, is now. But intimacy it has a far deeper meaning. Intimacy is a connection with another person on an emotional level. Intimacy is a connection with another person on an intellectual level. Intimacy is a connection with another person on a spiritual level, spirit to spirit. Intimacy is a connection with another person uh, in terms of mutual interest and, and common desires. Intimacy is a connection to another person heart to heart and soul to soul. And the reason we have so many broken relationships today, the reason we have so many fractured relationships today, and the reason we have so many fragmented relationships today is because our generation has a false understanding of what intimacy is all about. I want to explain this. You see, intimacy is not instant. It's not manufactured while you wait. Intimacy is a process. Intimacy takes time to develop. True intimacy cannot develop overnight. And here it comes. You ready for it? Above all else, intimacy requires trust. Intimacy needs time investment. There's no going around this. Thinking about the time investment, I thought of a, a story of the young couple who fell in love with each other and they wanted to get married. But the young man got conscripted into the military and he was shipped overseas and he was to serve overseas for a year. Uh, but before leaving, he promised his wife to be that he's going to be writing her a letter every single day while he's away. And sure enough, he did. He sent 365 letters. The young woman got married a year later, as planned, to the mailman. <laughs> but you've got to understand, intimacy develops over time. In fact, this particular truth was not lost on a dear old maid who never dated anyone, let alone married. And so she died at the age of 96, and she left clear instructions in her will about her funeral. She said, there will be no male pallbearers. Her explanations. They did not take me out while I was living, <laughs> and they won't take me out when I'm dead. But why intimacy is such a problem in our culture? First, as already indicated, intimacy requires a focused attention, a concentrated time. It's like the boy who kept talking to his father. Dad, are you listening? And the father said, I'm listening, I'm listening while he was working. And he said, Dad. And the father kept saying, I'm listening, I'm listening. And he was not. Finally, the boy got so exasperated, he said, Dad, listen to me with your face. <laughs> But secondly, intimacy is based on mutual trust. When trust is broken, intimacy is shattered. When trust is betrayed, intimacy becomes very difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it becomes very difficult. Trust, on the other hand, opens the heart and opens the mind to the trusted one. Um, trust makes fear banish, makes suspicion banish. 
Whatever that trust, whether it's between a husband and wife, or it's between two brothers in Christ, or two sisters in Christ, two intimate friends, will banish fear of rejection when it's exercised. Now, you know, I don't get psychological on you, and I'm not going to start now, but I just want to explain something that's very important. Because most often, the person who is unable to keep trust is because somehow, somewhere, sometime, they have experienced betrayal. And they just can't get over that. Somehow, somewhere, sometime, they've experienced rejection, and they can't get over that. Somehow, some way, sometime, they've experienced deception, and they can't overcome that. Why? They are not able to allow the blood of Jesus Christ to heal their past. So they live their lives repeating that betrayal. They live their lives unable to trust anyone or accept trust of others. Someone said, a real friend is the person with whom you dare to be yourself. Why? Because intimacy is built on trust. And trust takes time to build and develop. Trust takes real commitment. Uh, trust is the very heart of intimacy. Now, there are some people who don't even understand trust and don't comprehend trust and and they get confused about trust. In fact, not long ago, I was reading an article about how the super rich in our day and, and the celebrities, they are unable to have real friends. And they said that's really a problematic for them. And the reason is because they can never know if the person is befriending them only for what they can get out of them. No wonder they get on these drugs and then as we're seeing of late, many of them are taking their own lives. What a way to live. <laughs> what a way to live. But listen, I am so thankful that I have a super rich friend. He is a super, super rich friend who knows my motives and he still wants me to befriend him. In fact, I'm building all this to get to this point. Intimacy with my super rich friend and Savior and Lord is that he longs for me to befriend him. And you know him too. With my super rich Savior and Lord, I can be absolutely sure that he loves me and never worries about what I want out of him. How? Because he knows my motives and still loves me. He knows my desires and he still loves me. He knows my fears and my failures, and He still loves me. He knows my weaknesses and my foibles, and He still loves me. I know He wants a true intimacy with me, and He wants it with you. But the question is, do I know how to develop intimacy with Jesus? I want to talk to you about this. How to develop intimacy with Jesus? Because true intimacy with Jesus is more than just coming to him with your grocery list. Lord, give me three of these, two of that, seven of the other, and preferably on the house. Now, don't misunderstand me. Don't misunderstand me. I believe the Lord wants to hear our petitions. I believe the Lord wants to hear our requests. I believe the Lord wants to hear our desires and our prayers. But to develop intimacy with Jesus, you have to learn to really... Listen as well as speak. Did you know that Jesus actually desires intimacy with you more than you do? Did you know that? Somebody here might say, well, wait a minute, Michael. I really tried. I really tried to listen. But my mind wanders all over the place, and I can't listen to God. Not if you're listening to him with his word open in front of you. If you come to his presence with the expectations of hearing him through his word, he will speak to you. That's his promise. Did you know that some people really do not want to hear from God? And the reason they don't want to hear from God is that they are afraid the Holy Spirit may speak to them. I know what I'm talking about. 
Sometimes people are afraid of his conviction, so they don't listen. They're afraid that he's going to put his finger. Now the Holy Spirit doesn't have a finger, but you know what I mean. He's going to put his finger on something that reveals some attitude or some habit or some action that requires confession and repentance. Others are actually afraid to hear God lest he say love words to them. And in their erroneous thinking, they feel unworthy to hear words of his love. That's false. Others are afraid that they may hear nothing. Let me tell you something. Nothing is something <laughs> when it comes to God. Because God delights in us being in his presence. Sometimes you don't have to say anything. Sometimes he doesn't have to say anything. Now here's the problem. Some people don't develop intimacy with Jesus because they know they're going to have to get real with him. And getting real with Jesus may cause them to have to stop doing some things that they don't want to stop. Or that he may not give them what they're asking for. Or that he may give them what they don't want. <laughs> and so they go around knowing in their heads that Jesus died for them. They believe that they are saved by grace. They believe that God is good, especially when he answers their prayers. In their head, they know a great deal about Jesus. Uh, in their head, they can even discern biblical truth. In their head, they know Christian doctrine, and they know all of that. In their head, they develop this knowledge of who Jesus is, but never an intimacy with Jesus. Why? Because they never knew how to love him with all of their heart. This whole series of messages built on one verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. And we saw it in the very first message. And you shall love the Lord with all your mind. We saw that, how to love him with the mind, the seat of the will, the decision making. Then love him with your imagination, love him with your soul. And then today I'm talking about how to love him with all of your heart. Not just with your heart, but with all your heart. What is that heart? I'm not talking about that muscle that beats in left side of your chest all the time. No, I leave that to the cardiologist. <laughs> but when the Bible speaks of the heart, it is always referring to the center of our personality. And that is why when we say to people, receive Jesus into your heart, what do we mean by receive him into your heart? It's like the little girl who said, Jesus is in my heart. I don't know how he got there, <laughs> but he's in my heart, which is fine. Good to teach the kids that, but, but you've got to go a little further and explain what that means. What does it mean to say, I've received Jesus into my heart? You are saying that I am inviting him to occupy the very center of my personality. That I'm inviting him to occupy the very center of my being. That I'm inviting him to occupy the very center of my totality. Well, someone would say, well, Michael, I pray all the time. I pray in the car. I pray at work. I pray all day long. I pray. I, I pray. Good. Don't stop. I'm not asking you to stop. But I want you to imagine the following scenario with me. Suppose you have a friend that he or she has the habit, as soon as you pick up the phone, as soon as the phone rings and you say hello, that friend just starts talking. And then they talk, and they talk, and they talk. Some of you are grinning. You have friends like that. <laughs> and they talk, and they talk. And before you say, ah, they hang up. Goodbye, thank you. Now, let me ask you, can you really develop intimacy with that friend? No, you can't. Intimacy requires listening. Intimacy requires attention. Intimacy requires time investment. You know, like most dads, I have learned a great deal from my children. I really have. Every one of the four children taught me some aspect 
about my relationship with my Heavenly Father. They really have, everyone. One of those lessons I'll never forget, Jonathan was nine years old. And the house that we lived in, my study was in the basement. Now, while the basement itself had some daylight, my study itself had no daylight. It was four walls. Four walls. That's it. There's nothing to look at, no view. Unless you're desperate, you don't want to go to my study. <laughs> That's it. Now, of course, I'm telling you this for a reason. One day, when I was down studying, working in my, in my study, writing, praying, looking at some reference books in, in my library, and Jonathan comes in, nine years old, and he just sat in the chair. Like most suspicious dads, I thought, well, he wants something. He just come down, sat down. So, naturally, I asked, can I get you anything? No, nothing. I kept working, I kept working, praying, picking up. Ten, fifteen minutes later, I said, surely he, he, he couldn't be hanging around in this four-wall room for nothing. So I said, you sure I can't do anything for you? Nothing. So I waited a little bit longer. It's almost 45 minutes passed. And I asked a third time, are you sure there's nothing I can do for you? There's nothing you want? Nothing. No. The next morning I was praying, and the Holy Spirit began to convict me. I used your younger son to teach you a valuable lesson in your relationship with me. He didn't want anything. He did not need anything. He did not ask for anything. He just wanted to sit in his father's presence. Now, that lesson helped me grow in leaps and bounds in my intimacy with God. Probably no other way I would have grown in my intimacy with God without that lesson. And today I can sit in the presence of Jesus unheard, silent at times. Sometimes I hear things from his word. Other times I don't. It makes no difference. The fact that you choose to spend time in his presence is honoring to him. Now, most of us, I think, want to hear from God, especially if we're in a bind and we want answer to something and we don't know which way to turn. But then we want to hear from God while the television is bellowing away, phone is ringing off the hook, we're multitasking and doing all sorts of things. And we wonder why we can't hear from God and wonder why our intimacy with Jesus is not going anywhere. The man who had the greatest influence on John Wesley, the Count of Zinzendorf, he said, an understanding which arises out of concepts changes with age and with education and with circumstances. But an understanding that's arrived at through experience is not subject to these changes. In fact, such understanding becomes better with time. Your intimacy with Jesus can only grow better with time when you begin to experience his presence. Listen, I know in our culture, I know, and it grieves me, I cannot tell you, I know we get bored with ideas and we get bored with life and we get bored with relationships. And yes, some people even get bored with churches. What was once new becomes stale, old, and familiar. But not in your intimacy with Jesus. Not in your intimacy with Jesus. The more you spend time with him, the more you know him, and the more you know him, the more you love him. And the more you love him, the more you get to love him more. And the more you love him, the more you love him with all your heart. Only then will you recognize that God is most available 
to those who are most available to him. One of the words you can reflect on, he died for me. He died for me. Can you say that with me? He died for me. He died for me. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther said that those two words, for me, for me, ought to be written in golden letters on the heart of every believer. For me. Why? Because it tells us of the Savior who wants us. It tells us of the Savior who longs to befriend us. It tells us about the Savior who longs for intimacy with us. Because it tells us of the Savior who longs for us to be intimate with Him. Some years ago, a well-known magazine, Psychology Today, surveyed 40,000 Americans. Question. What qualities in life do you value the most? You'll be surprised with the answers. Number three was warmth and affection. Number two was loyalty. Number one was trust. Trust. That's the longing of the heart of people, whether they know Jesus or not. Now, beloved, the reason you can love Jesus with all of your heart is because you can truly trust Him. You can trust Him. You can trust Him. You can trust Him that He has your best interest in heart, even when He doesn't give you what you're asking for. You can still trust Him, uh, even when he doesn't do what you want him to do. You can still trust him. Even when he does things that puzzle you and don't make sense to you, you can still trust him. I said earlier that intimacy takes time to build up and to develop. I wrote the book, Trust and Obey, for that reason. I always love for people to learn from my failure. If you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. If you, even if you haven't read the book, the title gives it away, Trust. Trust. They wanted to give, the, give you the impression that I've trusted the Lord from the very beginning of my walk. I didn't. In fact, there was a time when the Lord did exact opposite of what I was asking and praying for earnestly. And I had a hard time trusting. My goodness, but as I look back, I go on my knees in thanksgiving for him not answering that prayer and many others. As I grow in intimacy with my Lord, even when I go through some puzzling circumstances, as I always do, I can only testify of him. That the one who was there and there and there, he's going to be here. I can tell you on the authority of God's Word that when you trust Jesus during the times when you don't have an answer as to why He's doing something that He's doing, when you trust Him, especially in those times, especially in those times, you are honoring Him. And you know what His Word promised to those who honor Him. He said, I honor those who honor me, says the Lord. Program, uh, leading the way, which is the ministry inside the kingdom sat, I bring it to you every day in English, Arabic, and French in the hope that God will use it to minister to you and to your needs. And I pray that God has led many of you to greater and higher depth in walking with him as a result of Malakot Sat. God bless.